Welcome to Across Africa, our weekly look at stories from across the continent. I'm Georgia Calvin-Smith, and this week in Rwanda, 29 years after the genocide that cost at least 800,000 lives, and the psychological toll on those who lived through the bloodshed continues to weigh heavily. Also, we hear from some of the young visionaries in the Seychelles, coming up with ways to keep the ways of life relied on by island states afloat. Humans have had a devastating impact on the world's oceans, and for many, it is not an exaggeration to say that the threat is existential. And Kenya is the first country on the continent to make coding an integral part of the school curriculum. It has a digital master plan to be at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution. But first, it's been 29 years since at least 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus were massacred in 100 days of genocide in Rwanda. The grim anniversary is a particularly tough time for those still bearing the psychological scars of what they witnessed or suffered. Many still need therapy to this day. Our correspondents report. It could just be friends reuniting, yet the survivors of the Tutsi genocide hardly know each other. Every April, just before the commemorations of the 1994 massacres, they prepare to face the ghosts of the past. I had a very large family, but they all perished in the genocide. May they rest in peace for eternity. Over 100 days, millions of Rwandans will gather across the country to keep memories of their loved ones massacred 29 years ago alive. It's always a tough time for survivors with mental health issues. The government says that a quarter of the population shows symptoms of post-traumatic stress. When people commemorate, heavy feelings can come up and flashbacks. Here we're trying to demonstrate this so they're able to start commemorating with a stronger mindset. As well as discussions, the survivors group organizing these meetings hold prayers and physical activities to help those affected by trauma relax. When I saw my disabled little brother, who had injuries all over his body, I fell into a deep depression. I couldn't join in the commemorations, because I refused to meet the people who did that. I didn't even want to follow the ceremonies on the radio. Sometimes I turned it off and locked myself in the house, day and night. In Kigali, health professionals are also preparing for the commemorations. Every year, patients flock to the only psychiatric hospital in the city. Sometimes the agitation can be so intense that it leads to a confused state, a depressive state with significant suffering, followed by deep depression. A more serious illness, such as psychosis, may develop during this time. Despite significant demand for treatment, Rwanda currently has only about 15 psychiatrists across the country. Somaliland is a self-declared state, even though technically it's still seen as being part of Somalia. This lack of diplomatic recognition does make it difficult to keep development plans on track. Though Hargeisa insists it's politically stable compared to Somalia and its Ethiopian neighbours, attracting international investment has proven to be difficult. Our correspondents tell us more. The port of Berbera is being modernised. The Emirati company DP World has invested more than 400 million euros in it. The gateway to Somaliland can now receive around 500,000 containers per year. Since we are expanded, uh, we received the bigger facilities, which is carrying 10,000 containers. And that's called direct call from China, from India, so we can supply other regional ports from here. The facilities currently serve Ethiopia and compete with the port of Djibouti. Somaliland's pushing to further develop its infrastructure. The capital is also growing rapidly. Buildings and hotels are multiplying and the diaspora is driving many of the projects. I'll show you one of our rooms. Come. After 20 years in England, Mustafa returned to invest in his country. Luxurious rooms, restaurants, he spent almost 7 million euros to create this place. If you invest Somaliland, the, the rate of return is very high. At the moment, you know, the invest, I mean, the, the stability and the economy of this country is growing. At least 40% of the population benefits from remittances from the diaspora. The Minister of Finance admits that they have an important economic impact. 
He believes recognition of the country is key to its successful development. Although Somaliland is a sovereign state in practice, it is still technically considered to be part of Somalia. Now we want to build a port or an airport or a road which requires maybe 100 million US dollars. Normally, a recognized country would go to the, to the World Bank or to one of the international financial institutions and borrow money. We can't. Somalia needs this international support. If assessed as an independent nation, its GDP per capita is around 700 euros, making it the poorest country in the world. Rome says that more than 28,000 migrants have arrived in Italy since the start of the year, almost four times more than over the same period last year. The UN, meanwhile, reckons that the number of boats trying to make it over from Tunisia is up by 226%. Our team reports. The Tunisian Coast Guard tracks migrant boats at sea 24 hours a day to intercept the informal crossings. These migrants are refusing to leave their boats. This particular night, nine boats each with about 30 people are arrested. These are record numbers and the high season hasn't even begun yet. In the early morning, we come across a boat of Tunisians, one of whom also brought their child with them and agreed to talk with us. I brought my daughter and family because of the living conditions back home. How long can we keep up with rent? We can't build a house. Day and night I run around working so we can eat. It's my third attempt at a crossing and I'll try again, hopefully. The number of migrants from Tunisia and other African countries is rising. President Kaysaid's anti-migrant speech in February sparked violence against black workers and many were kicked out of their homes and jobs and now feel a sea crossing is the only way out. In Sfax, we meet Elki from Ivory Coast, who survived a shipwreck in March. My husband lost his job. That's why, with the little money we had, we used it to leave. Elki lost her son and husband in the wreck. Still in shock, she doesn't know what to do next. If I go back now, I have nothing to give my family. They'll say, you did six years here and you have nothing to send back home. What can I say? Tunisian authorities are struggling to stop the flow of people towards Italy. With the current economic crisis and state of public finances, Tunisia can't manage the migration issue. You can see already everything depends on civil society groups. It's these organizations that provide food, diapers and milk. Unfortunately, in Sfax, we don't even have a center to temporarily place arrested migrants. At the port of Sfax, we find a National Guard boat that arrested close to 300 migrants in one night. Once they arrive at port, they are all released. Several of them are likely to try to make the crossing again as soon as they are able. Kenya is emerging as a regional leader in Africa's booming tech sector. It recently became the first country on the continent to make coding part of its primary and secondary school curriculums. It is an important investment in the push to shape the next generation of programmers and engineers and to further foster innovation. Inside Nairobi's sprawling Kibera slum, these primary school students are headed to class with a skip in their step. They're 11 or 12 years old and are already learning how to code. We are going to continue from where we left. In today's lesson, pupils must create a short animated clip featuring their favorite animal. A fun and playful introduction to programming with an eye on their future careers. We are introducing them to this. It's because the world is moving to a digital place, you know. So if they get these skills at a very young age, they'll, um, it gives them a chance to be like lifelong learners. I think coding can be their future. Inspired by these lessons, young Joanne is already dreaming of working in the digital sector. I would like to have a job like creating cartoons, stories, and creating games. Kenya recently became the first African country to include coding in its primary and secondary education curriculums. A move that could help cement the country's leadership in the booming information and communications technology sector. Nairobi is already considered one of Africa's major tech hubs, earning it the nickname Savannah Valley. In recent years, new co-working spaces have sprung up like mushrooms across the capital, reflecting a growing global demand for young tech-savvy Kenyans. 11 Python engineers from Kenya are actually going to, are moving um, to Sweden. In fact, they're moving this month 
and we have some of the greatest skill sets here. This proves it. The goal isn't only to send workers abroad, but also to bring big tech closer to home. The likes of Google and Microsoft already opened offices in Nairobi, and Kenya hopes more will soon follow suit. Overfishing, global warming and plastic pollution are having a devastating impact on the world's oceans. Researchers warn that marine ecosystems could almost completely collapse within 25 years. Our team headed to the Seychelles to meet with some young entrepreneurs dreaming of ways to water down the damage already done. Johan, a 20-year-old Mauritian entrepreneur, has just a couple of minutes to pitch his idea to a group of officials. But he's not in the least bit nervous. I feel like I'm in The Voice. So what do we offer at Sea Life? Put simply, we gather seaweed in an eco-friendly way and then transform it into agricultural products. Johan's smooth delivery has been honed through training workshops where he also learned how to raise financing and measure the impact of his initiative. He is among some 100 people taking part at the first ever regional forum for youth entrepreneurship in the blue economy, a platform set up by the international organization of La Francophonie, which aims to support entrepreneurs working in the sector. Abidat, who makes fertilizer from natural waste, is another keen participant. I had an innovative project, but I couldn't reach the market. I couldn't picture who my target client was. And thanks to this forum, I now have the tools to be able to sell and put myself out there. The forum has helped André to get over his fear of pitching in French. The 30-year-old from the Seychelles has been working on a new social network called Hyperwave for almost a year. The platform doubles as a hub for those looking to invest in clean oceans. Social networks are catalysts of change and with the capacity of bringing people together. So why not use them to help the ocean? His pitch went down well. Hyperwave was selected among the 10 best projects at the forum, winning a 5,000 euro grant and a six month mentorship. But the work is not over yet. It is difficult to access loans and subsidies in the seashells because of a complicated maze of bureaucracy. Even more challenging is the fact that industrial fishing represents more than 20% of the archipelago's GDP. Well, that's it for Across Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Till then, take care.